I would first like to say thank you to everyone that's here, everyone that made it out. You all have made the ACT experience very rewarding for myself, a student, and for all the other professionals that are here. So I'd like to let you all give yourselves a hand for a second if you want to go ahead. And thank you to Dr. Samir Husney and his team and everyone that made this weekend, well, this is not weekend, this week possible, wonderful. Uh, I want to introduce myself. I'm a student, a senior of Dr. Husney's class. My name is Jared the Brainiac Boyd. Um, I'm not bragging on myself. I'm not bragging on myself. I promise you guys, I'm not bragging on myself. I'm calling myself the Brainiac right now because I'm getting in character. I'm very pumped up about this. I found out last week that I was going to be uh, shadowing this man right here that's on, on your notepads. If you haven't seen him, his name is Mr. Sax Luther. And Sax Luther is a foil to Super Samir. Super Samir, everyone, is a superhero, and Sax Luther is the villain. So I said, you know, I'm not used to that. But I'm, I, I'll be a villain. I, I said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm taking on that villain role. So the Brainiac is a villain in Superman's world that uses technology to give Superman some trouble. How about that, guys? You like, you like that technology giving Superman some trouble? <laughs> Super Samir some trouble. So I would like, on the behalf of the entire Legion of Media Doom, to introduce to you all Mr. Sax Luther, Bo Sax of Precision Media. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do I mentor them well or what? So it's great to be at the end, quite frankly, and I love coming here. I'll come here every year for the next 10 years. Now, we've been hearing about doom and gloom and death, and, and I have this slide here to show you that uh, Socrates is not drinking hemlock. He's drinking a Heineken. This program is not about death. Um, it is to print or not to print. We're going to bring down in 10 minutes, and I'm going to try to narrow this down into 10 minutes to some printers, and we'll do some conversation about if print is surviving, somebody's got to do it, and who's going to do it? Well, it's going to be these printers. But um, Jared is right, um, and Samir was right that I would put a slide in here. Uh, we've been great friends for many, many years, and on your behalf, Samir and I have debated the future of this industry. Uh, this goes back to 2007. We've been at it for quite some time. We do have our differences, uh, but we remain steadfast friends. And it's not every set of publishing pundits that have their own comic strip. <laughs> Our friendship is a joy to behold. <laughs> All right, that being said, let's talk about Act Five. We heard Michael Clinton uh, <laughs> speak on Tuesday, and um, it was a joyous, uplifting, uh, tremendous event. Sir, can you give me my speaker's notes? Yeah. You need, uh, you need an explain? No, this is digital. Let me, uh, digital? <laughs> <laughs> if I ad lib, we'll be here all day. OK, so we heard Michael Clinton talk on Tuesday night, and his talk was indeed enthusiastic. It was uplifting. And Hearst is doing many, many wonderful things. Absolutely. But he's a publishing Olympian. <laughs> and he's, for, he's, you know, he's from a group of Olympians. And if you have as much money as a Greek god, it makes the transformation of our industry look pretty darn easy. They can afford to fail many times without affecting the bottom line. On the other hand, 9,000 of the rest of us are on the planet Earth. You know, and oddly enough, we don't have Olympian resources. And yet we do have some, some uh, publishing houses that are doing quite well. Morris Communications, Hoffman are just a few that are surviving this death. <clears throat> so over the past few years, we have heard some grim news and averages about what's happening in our industry. And those averages are the truth. But most times, averages overlook many cases of individual success. There's an age-old phrase that claims that one bad apple can spoil the whole bunch, meaning an unapple, in unapple terms, that one wrong person can negatively affect a whole group. I'm wondering if the reverse can be true. Can one person, or even one small number of persons, 
Show exemplary leadership and change the direction of the bunch in a positive direction. So here's what I'm getting at. The latest reports on the magazine circulation newsstand sales have been dauntingly negative when viewed as a whole. In the last show, Tony said that we lost 50% newsstand sales in the last five years. That's absolutely true. So the mid-year report was filled with sad statistics, such as the top selling 25 titles, of the top selling 25 titles, only three improved their sales. And of the top 100, there were only 24 that showed positive momentum. But what about the winners in that multitude of industry misery? Is totality really the only effective way to look at the publishing industry? Are we actually one big publishing company and it's sink or swim together? Or are there thousands of separate companies and titles that have their own hidden successes as well as failures? As reported by John Harrington, who made a fine speech yesterday, um, John said that Food Network magazine was up 12.1%. Sports Illustrated grew 14.7%. Women's Health grew by 1% to 300 plus thousand. So although the statistics seem to point to a whole bad batch, it's not really true. As an example, I give you our state. Bernie Mann was here last year. Our state is an unaudited regional magazine from North Carolina. I recently spoke with Bernie Mann, who has described how his title has done, and it has nothing but grown for the last 15 years. That growth includes newsstand and subscriptions. Our state is not part of the national trend of magazines, just like Food Network, Sports Illustrated, and Women's Health. So what this means to all of us is that we aren't dead as an industry. I would admit that there are many, and there may be a great deal of industry pruning, but evidence has shown that constant growth is po a possible outcome for some titles and some sectors of our industry. With our predilection for shade and fraud, we humans love a story about things that have gone wrong, and we get distracted by the negative news, of which there is plenty and we forget that there are successes happening too every day. <coughs> this is a chart that my company made in 2007. It's an uh, analytical prediction of what, from the 2007 point of view, what might happen to the industry. It forecasts uh, a decrease in print, which we know to be happening, and an increase in digital revenue. Well, we were wrong about how fast the digital revenue will grow. Um, but I take a position that that chart, although not right to the year by year, is probably pretty well predicting what is happening and what will happen. So my friend, Dr. Joe Webb, who's a printing economist um, and good friend, he said to me last month in an email, this is what Joe says, what I try to remind people is that when industries are in transition, you get mixes of horror stories and success stories. Joe went on to say, when you look at the lines on a chart like economic data, it's easy to forget the millions of transactions and decisions that created them. Lines on a chart, no matter what the direction, falsely imply a simplicity of creation. Nothing can be further from the truth. At the final reading of any industry chart, there are winners and losers. Let us not forget that there are indeed winners in this time of adjustment and change for our industry. My analysis is, and always has been, that print will survive and it will be lucrative for those titles that get it right. Now I've tried a, a mixed metaphor here, the rising digital tide. Um, like the shorelines here, all publishing is being affected by the rising digital tides. In the near future, some of our titles will completely disappear, just like these coastlines. If you look at the map, hmm, Oxford and Memphis are gone. Even the mighty Disney World is no more. The same will most likely happen to print. We just don't know how much nor how fast the digital tides are rising, but what is left what is left in print will be choice, will be wonderful, will be excellently edited, 
and it will be built as a luxury item. Like all luxury items, the scarcity and the quality makes them what they are, something to hold and cherish. All the above slides is my primer for our conversation with printers. It's not a dialogue about death, but about surviving in rough seas. Repositioning a printing company is about more than changing the name and developing a new marketing message. It involves making hard decisions about how the printing market is shifting in new and different media. Developing the right product, the right services, and effectively communicating the transformation to both customers and prospects. Many people and companies may see the trends but lack the courage or the expertise to utilize them for the future business. This is often through, uh, through concern about the impact of their current mod, uh, model of business. A key message that comes from this is that it applies to all businesses, and I didn't say this, but Andrew Tribute did, it is your current business that should replace your current business before someone else replaces it for you. Malcolm, who I think is still in the room, he said the major opportunity in the magazine industry is to be ahead of the curve in ways in which magazines are going to monetize and build a consumer universe and sell more and interesting things to that audience. And on that note, can I get my panel? That was 10 minutes. Very good. Excellent. I started that this morning, sitting right over there. <laughs> Gentlemen, this is Gil Brechtel from Magnet. And he's wondering why he's on this panel. <laughs> but he tracks the sale of every single magazine that's sold. And that affects what these other three gentlemen do. Uh, John Park, Democrat Printing. Dick Ryan, Publishers Press. Gail Schwecki from Schwecki Media. And you know, I did what moderators usually do. I gave them questions a week ago. And we might throw some of that out the door. Um, but I will ask the first question, which is, who are you? Who do you work for? How long have you been there? And what does your company do? Gail? OK. <clears throat> My name is Gal Schweiki. And I uh, am the president of Schweiki Media. We're in San Antonio. And our mission is to make life better through print. We want to make life better for our customers, our <coughs> vendors, <coughs> employees and the community. I started the company, I was a student at the University of Texas, I graduated from UT, and I started a magazine for college students, an entertainment magazine called Study Breaks. And it was, an, it had all the best bands and restaurants and different things, that, places to go um, when you're in town. And, and you know, it, the first six months were really kind of rough when, when we got the magazine started. Uh, we'd put bands on the front cover, but one month there was not really too much going on as far as bands, so I kind of took a cue from Cosmo magazine and I got a picture of a girl in kind of a sexy outfit, and I put her on the cover. And then the world kind of changed for us because you could go on campus and there was no more magazines to be found. There were coupons in the magazine. They were getting better response. So kind of as Brian uh, talked about, this morning, if you find something that works, keep going with it. So we had a lot of pretty girls on the cover. And it turns out that one of the pretty girls was actually Renee Zellweger. She came to our office when she was a student at UT. And she was like, I'm a model. I'm an actress. I want to be on the cover of your magazine. We said, sure. So we take full credit for launching her career. Um, <clears throat> but we, the magazine grew. We, we grew it. it five universities. My print bill was the most expensive bill. So I decided I was going to get a printing press and print the magazine ourselves. We'd save money. It would be a lot of fun. And, and so uh, we kind of jumped into the printing business. And now not only do we print our magazine, but we print about 300 other titles. And the fact that we're kind of a printer and a publisher gives us a unique perspective with our clients. Dick? Uh, my name's Dick Ryan. Yes, we're going in order. OK. <laughs> yeah, I, I know I'm a printer. Just be easy with me. <laughs> Slow down. Just ship on time. Dick, yeah, OK. The, uh, my name's Dick Ryan. I'm the vice president of sales for Publishers Press. We're a uh, fifth generation privately held printer in Louisville, Kentucky. 
which by Bob's ice cap uh, melt sign, uh, looks like we're getting in the real estate business because we're going to be oceanfront property, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is good. Um, you know, because we got always want to hedge your strategy. Um, I think my apologies, to my good friend John Park. I think we're the largest privately held printer of magazines in the United States today. Always one up in me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say we were the best, John. I'm leaving that for you. Um, but. Uh, I've been with Publishers Press for uh, about seven years now, and before that I was uh, a publisher. Yeah, I started my career as a newspaper reporter in Milwaukee Journal, and I've owned a couple publishing and information companies before I, I uh, started work for Publishers Press back in uh, 2008. And going sequentially, I'm John Park, I'm Vice President, Chief Operating Officer of Democrat Printing and Lithographing Company. Uh, according to Bob's map, we're going to be uh, uh, shorefront property also in Little Rock. <laughs> we're getting in the real estate business. Yeah, man. Um, Publishers Press has uh, been a friendly competitor of ours forever. Uh, and, and I kind of uh, said something to Dick about one up in me. Michael uh, Simon, his boss, always one ups me because I love to say we're a fourth generation printer. We were founded in 1871. You know, it makes us out to be just this old, experienced company. They won up me five generations, 1868? 1866, right yeah. after right after uh, the other side won the Civil War. The wrong side. The wrong side. <laughs> the War of Northern Aggression. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, Publishers is uh, certainly a good company. Uh, we, we have been friends with them for a long time. Uh, but we're fourth generation. Uh, we're not as big as Publishers. Uh, I like to say that we're kind of like mom and pop printers. Uh, serving mom and pop customers. Uh, we don't go after the national long run magazines. We go after the more specialty type things. Uh, that's our niche. Uh, that's what we've been successful in and that's what we'll continue to do. What, what, you remind me that we are now facing the war of digital aggression. Okay. Next. <laughs> And I'm Gil Brechtel, president of Magazine Information Network, or MagNet, and uh, those of you who were here yesterday kind of heard my overview of what we do. We, uh, we capture all of the allocation, return, and sale data for every magazine sold at retail across 8,000 titles and about 150,000 retailers. And we also consult for publishers and help them get their product in the right place at the right time. Um, so that they can sell as many copies as they can. So here's the question that I didn't send to you guys. We've been here for two and a half days. Um, what's your take on what you heard in the last few days, and how do you think it impacts your business, or does it? You know, I think it's 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 really uh, it, it, it's amazing. You know what what we've heard. Uh, you know the, the the industry has really. Has really changed, and 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 our our business, you know, with 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 printing, from 1440 when Gutenberg invented the press till about 20 years ago, there was no changes. Okay, in the past five years, just to give you an example of what's happened in the in the print world, Heidelberg was the largest manufacturer of offset presses. They have a big print show every year. They were the largest booth five years ago, at that. Conference. This year I went, I just got back in, in September. Heidelberg wasn't even there, okay? Neither was another offset printer uh, manufacturer, Komori, okay? Who was there? Kodak, HP, Xerox, EFI. These are all digital print companies that specialize in inkjet and digital technology, which is, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's amazing. And, and what they do is they specialize in very quickly printing a lot of different sheets of paper. With different things on them, okay. So the the quantity of one can be done very efficiently now. So what does that mean for us? That means that you know now you as publishers, the publisher of the future, you know possibly in the future you get your Pinterest information from your from your readers, their Facebook, Twitter, Instagram information, and then you produce the magazine of you. So you get the Bo Sachs magazine every month okay. in the in the mail. You know, that, that may be the direction that we're going. And, you, and they see your tweets, so they know what you're interested in. So I see that, you know, a lot of people are talking about the, 
how it's all coming together. I think someone mentioned even Google buying a printing company. You know, I think that that's kind of what we're looking at. And, 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 the, and the print technology is kind of following that. It's enabling this, this, uh, this kind of joint. Uh, what did you learn the last couple of days, and how does it apply to your plant? Uh, candidly, I, I haven't learned much. Um, that, that's not to say, I'm not trying to be cynical about the program because I think it's been a great program. Uh, I'm encouraged by the young folks from uh, Old Miss that are here. Y'all are a very enthusiastic group and inquisitive, and I think that's a great thing. Um, I guess my takeaway on not learning anything per se is, uh, you know, having been around this. You know, I was, enter you know, the, the discussion earlier about having to call in stories. You know, when I started my career in this business when there were no cell phones, uh, and I, I too called in newspaper stories from a police precinct house to a copy editor on the other side of the phone. So it's a, it's a whole different play. Um, and my point is, is that it's so difficult to understand what even next year is going to be like, whether it's for a guy like me who is now printing uh, images on, on, on a sheet, or whether it's going to be the next new thing in digital. Um, the only reason I'm not giving uh, credit to John from Nellie Moser is I've heard him speak <laughs> so many times that, uh, but I, you know, the stuff that's going on with, with turning uh, pages or bringing pages to life and, and, and linking pages to uh, a, uh, an environment where a transaction could occur, I think, is something that's a very interesting um, area for the business to head. Michael Clinton talked a little bit about that. I would have liked to have known a little bit more about how they do that, because I think there hasn't, there, there's, there's still a glaring lack of discussion about workflow. Um, and I think it's a very important thing, especially for students today, to understand the workflow processes that are involved in, in getting something from here to there, whether it's whether the output's on paper or whether the output is digital or mobile or an application, or on radio or on cable television or whatever. So I, I um, learned, learned something. I, you know, I don't know whether I learned anything. Um, I, I wasn't, that, that wasn't the value proposition that I was expecting anyway. Okay, but. that's fair enough. John, did you pick up anything? Bob, I think it really just confirms what we've already known, that the industry is changing. Um, I'll go back to about 18 months ago. The Printing Industries of America did a study, uh, Dick, you may have seen it. In our segment of the printing market, our volume is going to drop 25% over the next 12 years to $40 billion. That's billion with a B. Now, that tells me there's still a market out there for those of us with oceanfront property. <laughs> and the ones who will survive will be the ones who are nimble who can make changes to continue to take care of their customers. Uh, no Publishers does a good job with that. It's like you're psychic or something. I was going to refer to this uh, 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 graph. Uh, Bob, I disagree with the volume that the uh, uh, print is dropping. Uh, I don't think it's going to be that steep. Uh, but we haven't seen the growth in the digital end of it yet. Uh, Let me correct the chart if I didn't express it clearly. This chart represents publishing revenue. Okay. But in it, that that reflects on yeah. how much print. But it's the okay. dark it's okay. the dark blue part is an estimate of what publishing revenue is from print. The turquoise is okay. publishing profit from print, and the other is trade shows and and the like. And then the other part of this, kind of touching on uh, uh, what Gal said. You talk about digital, it's not just iPads. It's digital print. It's print on demand. Uh, we don't really have it yet because nobody has had the guts to go in and print individual co uh, covers for individual subscribers. Uh, we had a customer do that once about 10 years ago. We could have shot him because you have to keep all the postal stuff in order, and it was just a pain. Yeah, sortation's always the killer. Never, yeah. never, never do that again. And they, they hadn't done it, but their, their individualized co uh, covers were uh, a satellite shot of that subscriber's home. So every magazine cover was different. Now, they really stretched out there and did it, and I think they lost their butt on it. But 
until somebody goes out there and tries to be that innovative and stretch it out that far where they can show some sort of revenue off of that, I think we're still going to be kind of stagnant. Yeah. You're not a printer. No, I know. And, you know, in some respects, I'm glad I'm not, but I'm in a newsstand business, so that's, you know, what you, that's, that's so much worse. You have the, uh, <laughs> I guess the word might be authority to track the product of publishers. Yeah. So based on what you heard in the last few days and what these gentlemen just said, what's your reaction? Well, you know, uh, listen, Newsstand is still a $3.1 billion business. Yes, it used to be more than that. Um, you know, our numbers don't show a 50% decline in the last five years. It's more like 40%, okay, but it's still a big decline. <laughs> the good news is that, um, you know, when you look at our business, and, and it goes to what you said earlier to intro this, this panel here, Bo. I mean, there are segments of our business that are doing very, very well. I mean, four or five years ago, we really didn't have bookazines. And now bookazines do about $450 million a year, represent close to 14% of our business. And publishers continue to produce these, even though they have very little advertising. Uh, and no subscriptions. So when consumers will pluck down $13, $14 for good quality content, you know, it tells you that there is still a need for print. And, and somebody print, has to print a book, is he? Exactly right. And print will, will be around. I think my takeaway from the conference, and again, kudos to Samir, who every year is able to assemble such a great group of speakers, very diversified in, in what they say. I think I, I'm going to leave here with more questions than answers in this respect. You know, you had publisher speaking, uh, Michael Clinton, and you had uh, Vanessa and Roy, and, and, you know, talking about how they're transitioning their business and how they're chasing the audience and all that sort of stuff. But the thing that I'm going to leave here with, again, questions is, okay, Print is declining. Malcolm said yesterday that you know if you look at a publisher that's producing a, a, a monthly magazine and producing a thousand pages of content, and they're trying to sell a subscription to that content for five dollars a year, that's not a business model, right? And then you look at digital, where you have four percent of the revenues, uh, publisher revenues um, in in digital come from digital. I'm not sure that's a great, uh, a great model, at least for now. So my point is, is that I'm concerned, and the more questions I have is about the industry and what we do as an industry, a publishing industry, to grow our revenues in the future. Bob, if I can interject and be moderator. <laughs> Since you track newsstand sales, one of our biggest segments are the giveaway magazines. Um, as I've said before, never underestimate the ego of the upper middle class suburbanite who wants to see their picture in these magazines at some party. Uh, we print these things, I know y'all do too, uh, the society magazines for Little Rock, for towns as small as Paragould, Arkansas, Fort Smith, Arkansas, just all over, and they pretty much consist of party picks, like, like you have in college. And uh, these people love to see their pictures. Great business. Yeah. Um, matter of fact, my, my wife Susan. Susan, wave at everybody. Susan's in the uh, 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 retail clothing business, uh, upscale women's boutique. All of her advertising is in these giveaway magazines. It's not in subscription-based. It's not on newsstand stuff. It's stuff that's going out. And if she doesn't advertise a new line coming in, her customers let her know. You know, so when you're talking about the big graph up here, you know, it's not all the hearse, it's not the big gorilla, uh, it's not all the individual newsstand sales. There's still the individual giveaways, and these people are making enough money to make a living. I don't know what the numbers are. You know, half a million, a billion, who, who knows? Um, but yeah, they fly under the radar. They're not accounted. It's not anywhere. under our radar. No. But it's not accounted anywhere except in your shop. Yeah. Right. And that helps support It's your serious shop. business to us. Right. Yeah, we print a, a series of books, just like John said, this uh, 
focusing on the high end of any local demographic is always a good idea because um, that's where the money is spent and people like to see their pictures in newspapers or magazines, excuse me. But we, we produce a series of magazines that are growing very quickly under the brand Sophisticated Living. Uh, they started in Louisville, they're now in Lexington, they're in Cincinnati, um, they're up in Chicago now, which I think might be a little bit of a mistake for them, but uh, they're in Indianapolis, St. Louis, and they've, I just saw what's called a new title spec sheet for a, a new one that they're going to do in Phoenix. They only distribute 10,000 in each of these markets, and they guarantee that they're going to get that book into the 10,000 richest households. And if you can, that, that, that helps do a couple things. One, it keeps the ad rate reasonable but it also guarantees for the advertiser that their message is going to be possibly exposed to the people who are going to be spending money. Thick books, um, great paper, they spend a lot of money on images, uh, decent content, but it's really, they're fashion books basically is what they are for, for local markets. And while I'm moderating, I want to throw in there, that's another advance digitally is uh, the socioeconomic information that's available from companies like Axiom where people can pull uh, uh, a dress list or household list based on uh, household income. Yeah. And they can further mine down to what their target audience is. Is the same in your shop? Yeah, So just, and just to add, add to that, so these local kind of society magazines, in addition to their publication to boost their revenue, in our markets, they host happy hours that are really successful and they charge people, you know, to come to these happy hours and people come and, you know, they, they donate a percentage of, of it to charity and that's, they, they give and away their money. And sponsors the happy hour. Right, right. and they get sponsors and so, right. you know, it, it, it works out really well. It's a great, uh, great business model. So what I take from that is that uh, publishers needn't fear for their well-to-do printers, it's you guys who'd be fearing for us. You guys will survive whether we're around or not. Mm, only if I, we're nimble know. and we're smart and we do the right thing. But you are it, nimble and smart. I am, yeah. Those other industries. <laughs> <laughs> it was really hard to be nimble and smart. You know, our business is one of economics, and if you if you know if you can identify the problem, whether you're a publisher or whether you're a printer or whether you're a website <laughs> operator or a, you know, maker of apps, if you can identify the problems you're confronted with then you can, you can solve your way out of those problems. And in, in 2009, we all, not you, Gil, but the three of us, you were around in 2009, right? Okay, so we were all, what happened very quickly, almost within the span of 60 days, which was remarkable, was that uh, publishers were going out of business, so we had titles failing. We had those publishers that remained um, we're beginning to send in 48-page books instead of 64 and, and uh, larger. So we had page count go down drastically. Now remember, we, our, our, we have fixed equipment in our shop, so our expenses, I have people running those presses, and so my costs are pretty fixed, but I've got books disappearing, less pages coming in, and those that remained, for us to keep them in business, they literally, almost 50% of them within 60 days, we have 1,200 titles that we produce at Publishers Press, and I've only named one of them, and you better not call them. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, but Jennifer's up here. Well, I know. <laughs> um, they all were looking for price concessions, so we had sort of a triple perfect storm that worked against us, and so, but the problem was identifiable, and we were working our way out of it by competing hard for targeted, uh, small to mid-run business that, that I think, I agree with John, flies under this radar screen here. I, I want to get back to Gil and ask him a question about bookazines, and we're going to close this up in 10 minutes. Um, but I would suggest, uh, on one of my favorite subjects, is you guys are entrepreneurs, and the way you're going to survive is by not following whatever track your business used to be on, but you're scrappy, you're lean, and you're going to entrepreneurialize your way into the future. Which brings me to exactly what you were saying. My, my, um, my excellent shadow, Jared, and my shadowette, Chloe, I had um, serious conversations with them. Um, they're both seniors, and they're naturally concerned about their future, and I was offering whatever advice I could. But the part that you bring up, and I, maybe it's my ego, you know, I'm trying to work on that too. Uh, my first publication was a free circulation, supported by advertising, free distribution, and we were scrappy entrepreneurs, and we just didn't know. On 500 bucks, we started a newspaper. Um, that was the, the, the first foundation block for the rest of my career. So for you students in the room, entrepreneurism is good, 
um, it can lead to an exciting career either on your own or in the corporate world, as it did for me. Um, and you might consider one of the paths that these printers are talking about, creating your own press that's not audited, that uh, under the radar of some places, but you can make money. In fact, you can make a lot of money starting your own publication. It does need to be done well. You do need to have a good business plan. Not every one works, maybe one out of 10 works, but that's not bad. Um, here's what I wanna ask the bookazines, which printers are printing, do you think it's affecting, the success of bookazines is ex affecting other newsstand sales? Are we sacrificing one for the other? <clears throat> um, it's better, isn't it? It's made, it's mitigated the loss of newsstand, yes. Uh, when you look at, for instance, uh, probably the people who are in this space most would be Time Inc., right? Uh, they do a lot of bookazines. We're, we're affiliated with a publisher that's putting out uh, probably 60 bookazines a year. Um, I don't think that the Time Inc. specials have affected their monthly or weekly publications. They're putting out People Weekly, but they're also putting out People SIPs, right? Different subject matter. It's not timely. It's, it's repurposed content, you know, on one subject that's doing very, very well. So. You know, it's hard to measure, Bob, whether or not it's affecting overall newsstand sales of good housekeeping or other product, but I think it's lifting, you know, the, the rising tide lifts all boats, and I think it's lifting the boat by something. I would also say, just one other thing, you talked about audited and unaudited. Unaudited magazines always do better or have done better for many, many years compared to audited publications. And at one, they're not. Sorry, say that again. Unaudited, unaudited mag yeah. magazines are doing much better than audited. One because they're not necessarily chasing subscriptions, right? Or they're, they're not chasing rate base as much. So therefore, they can sell their newsstand magazines for a little bit higher, and and you don't see the giveaways like five dollar subscriptions for Cosmo that you would do that you do you know when you're when you're audited and you got to make that rate base. Personally, I've always been a fan of unaudited titles since I published several of them. So we need to close out. So shortly, you know, Samir has his favorite question about like, you know, what do you dream about or what are you afraid of or something like that. What, what keeps you up late? Yeah, what keeps you up late? That's not my question. <laughs> um, in all sincerity and, and all the dialogue we've had about the, not the death of print, let's just call it the diminishment of print are you encouraging your children to go into your business? Yeah, so, so I have two girls, one's five and one's nine, and I tell them they can do whatever they want, they can be whatever they want, they can, they can work for the printing company after medical school. So. <laughs> <laughs> you are one smart daddy. Um, my oldest is selling software in Chicago, my second oldest is a chef in Chicago, um, my youngest is a freshman at U of L and he wants to be a doctor, and so I'm letting them make their own minds up. What I will say to all the young people here is um, we're looking for young people up in publish at Publishers Press. We're right up the road in Louisville, so if any of you want to learn how pub magazines are really made, we can invest a couple years and have it. You won't want to stay there forever, I guarantee it, but um, if you want to learn a, bit, a little bit about how to manufacture magazines, which is an important part of this, uh, you know, give me your card and we'd be happy to talk to you. So I would encourage all y'all to consider getting into the magazine business for sure. John? Uh, my son's third year law student uh, has the uh, verbal and arguing skills to be a great litigator and he would be a waste on the printing industry. <laughs> uh, my daughter, if she wanted to get into it, would certainly be welcome. Uh, she's, you know, different situation, she's younger. Um, it all depends on the circumstance. Um, in a perfect world, let's just say, if I owned my own company, if I called my own shots, yeah, I would certainly encourage that because you would have the authority to make the decision you think is best and you can succeed or fail on your own. Uh, when you have numerous partners, you don't really have that flexibility. Uh, and, and some of the joy of uh, succeeding and the things you learn from failing, you, you don't really 
uh, get exposed to from that. I agree. It's great to be the master of your own ship. Uh, you know, I'm self-employed, and thereby I, I report to the best boss in the world. If I could just add one more thing. Yes, sir. I will say, you know, while my kids um, are heading in a different direction, uh, we have uh, Michael T. Simon, Jackson Simon, and Caroline Simon, a sixth generation of, of our family ownership that are all, I can guarantee you they'll all be working on the floor at Publishers Press in the next five years. Guarantee it. So it all helps been... All helps to have the right last name. It does. Yeah. I mean, I'm changing my name. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of adopted yet? Yeah. I some sideburns, too. <laughs> what they do in an extension, would you invite your children to... Well, my, my kids uh, all graduated from LSU, which is the Harvard of the South, you know. <laughs> the but, uh, and, you know, I have three daughters who basically were in the working world and now they're retired and, you know, help produce our nine grandkids. So they're at stay at home mom. My, my son's still working, but in, the, in more of the restaurant business. But so I doubt if they would be in our business. I can tell you, though, that. You know, Magnet has grown from, over the last, uh, let me think, six years, from three employees to 22. Uh, most of them all very smart, technical, savvy people who aren't afraid, and young, who aren't afraid to be in this business because they see and we see this business evolving. And where Magnet goes in the future, you know, we'll, we'll chase uh, digital sales. Uh, who knows? Uh, but I, I agree with what a lot of the speakers here said, you know, for the purpose of the students. I, I would not be a specialist. I think the business is changing so fast. You have to be just, you have to learn as much as you can on all aspects of this business. This business is going to be ar around in some form or fashion for hundreds and hundreds of years. That so couldn't close on a better and note. And we're seeing new titles all the time. Things are rapidly changing, but the one thing that absolutely will not change is the need to read. The substrate may change, but not the forward thrust of society, and we learn by reading. There will always be a way to make money by supplying good thoughts on whatever substrate is available. Um, and that's a very comforting thought. And on that, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you.